Hello, my name is Brink Lindsay. I'm Vice President uh, at the Niskanen Center, uh, and welcome to the latest in our series of videos on lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this video series is part of the Niskanen Center's larger project on rebuilding American state capacity. Uh, and certainly pandemic response is an area where a lack of state capacity uh, showed itself to fairly disastrous effect over the past couple of years. Uh, with me today uh, is Nikki Turan uh, from the Institute for the Future, um, who is a PhD geneticist, uh, but now a think tanker. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Um, so, right, we are we're the Institute for Progress. Inst what did I say? Institute for the Future. Oh, sorry. Which... Institute for Progress. Sorry. Uh, of course. Um, so tell me about the Institute for Progress. We're a nonpartisan think tank and advocacy organization where our goal is to advance progress um, while safeguarding the future. So uh, that's kind of where I come in in the safeguarding the future component. As so you're looking both to, both to rev up good things like supersonic travel and uh, advanced geothermal and also hold off bad things like pandemics and AI risk and terrible stuff like that. So you're you're on the doom and gloom side of the equation. I also think that there's a lot of progress to be had in the pandemic prevention space. There's a lot of technologies that we need to advance. So it's not all doom and gloom. Absolutely. Okay. What I thought we would do is we're going to uh, walk through, uh, so to back up a little bit, I, we've done uh, other videos in this series so far. All of them have been more, have been primarily retrospective, just a sort of depressing postmortem on what went wrong and why. Um, occasionally look at, at things that went right, like uh, Operation Warp Speed, but a lot of a lot of errors to uncover and diagnose and, and try to explain. Um, but here, uh, we're going to focus uh, pretty much entirely prospectively. Uh, how do we upgrade our policies and systems and institutions to be better prepared for next time? Uh, and from what I gather, there's pretty decent consensus on what a good comprehensive pandemic preparedness uh, program looks like. Um, we have uh, we have at least a couple of, of blueprints um, back uh, in uh, early 2021, the uh, Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, uh, headed by august bipartisan worthies like Tom Ridge and Joe Lieberman, uh, came out with this uh, sort of uh, Apollo project for biodefense, a, a big uh, you know, pull out all the stops uh, initial blueprint for uh, for how to do better than we did last time. Um, and then uh, sticking fairly closely, I think, uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong, to that basic game plan. Uh, the Biden administration came out with its uh, pandemic preparedness plan, uh, which it uh, at one time thought it was going to put into the, uh, the ill-fated Build Back Better uh, bill. Most of it never got in there. And then, of course, Build Back Better never got across the finish line. Um, so what we have now, there is one piece of legislation working its way through Capitol Hill called the Prevent Pandemics Act. We'll get to that later. First, I want to think about sort of the ideal or the optimal uh, uh, of what what do we need to be doing um, to, uh, to protect ourselves better. And so uh, right at the start is, is sort of early warning and monitoring. Um, we want to we want to know what viruses are out there that could make the jump to humans. We want to know ones that uh, we want to be uh, actively looking around to see if people are getting infected and if viruses are making the jump from animals to humans and if that's causing problems. Uh, um, so tell me, how do we go about doing those things better than we're doing now? We, we had some kind of, you know, international architecture for monitoring, which... Uh, uh, which has played a role in previous pandemics and played some role in COVID. It didn't work very well, um, but tell me how we can improve things on that front. One of the big differences, I think, between what we've had before for monitoring and what we really need is for it to be pathogen agnostic. So not searching out for a specific thing and checking if it's there or not. And um, really like ubiquitous, just everywhere all the time. So the, the hope would be to get a system where you can look for all of the nucleic acids, so that's DNA or RNA, of any pathogen. So any virus, any bacteria, 
um, and be able to see when it is growing in a population. So say people keep coming in with some weird kind of uh, pneumonia, you can swab inside their nose and mouth and sequence it, look for the genetic signature of anything there. Um, and if you see that you keep seeing more and more of either something you haven't seen before, a novel pathogen, or maybe something that's similar to something you have seen before, but you don't usually have a bunch of people coming in with a coronavirus related pneumonia, you can flag that as unusual and respond to it. Um, and so the hope would be not that you can just do this at like one hospital, but that you could do it throughout the world uh, at every hospital, but also just in the general population. So whether that's looking at like wastewater surveillance, um, so whatever ends up in the sewage system or potentially at blood banks. Um, so you can imagine something like HIV might not have shown up in the wastewater, but there would be other ways to detect it. And to, yeah, be able to collate all this information in actually a useful way where you have a whole bunch of team members looking at the same problem in the same way uh, in comparable, comparable formats. So this isn't so much like going out into the middle of the jungle and like searching for viruses okay. yeah. um, because you don't necessarily want to bring back things That's you don't a double want edged to sword, with I know. Yes. deal with. Yes, yeah, definitely a double-edged sword. Um, but it's like looking in people now, looking at our environment now and just seeing if anything unusual is arising. And so uh, for the Biden plan, how much of the of its monies and and programmatic focus was on just improving monitoring here in the United States? And what was it doing internationally on that front? Um, I have numbers in front of me, so I'm actually looking at them. So currently the request from the Biden administration that uh, went out for five years of mandatory funding for a total of $88 billion requests $1.5 billion for um, genomic surveillance. And so comparably, that's actually not that much. Um, I think that most of that is targeted domestically. Um, but there there are also currently like international collaborations occurring. Um, and actually, a lot of those are done through like USAID and um, the Department of Defense, as opposed to here, we'd have it go through the CDC. Yeah. Um... So one, there's the actual, you know, gathering the data uh, at blood banks, at hospitals, uh, the, uh, the uh, wastewater surveillance is like a particularly, you know, wholesale version of doing this. You, you, you see what's happening in whole communities. Um, but then uh, for the data to be useful, it's got to be uh, it's got to be collated and, 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 you know, coordinated. So it all fits together and is, you know, uh, legible to decision makers. That seems to be a, an especially big challenge for the United States, given our highly privatized patchwork healthcare system. Um, I know like a lot of the, uh, sort of best genomic sequencing that's been done during the, the pandemic wasn't done here. Uh, a lot of it was, uh, some of the best stuff was done in the UK. One of the reasons for that is they've got the National Health Service. They've got this state-owned, you know, medical system. So it's all monolithically coordinated. It may have some downsides on other fronts, but in, in terms of <laughs> gathering data together, uh, that uh, uh, they, they, uh, they avoid challenges that we must face and surmount. Uh, so how do we go about knitting our very variegated uh, private and public healthcare systems into into a coherent data whole. I actually don't necessarily think the biggest issue is the private versus public healthcare services because you can require reporting of um, this kind of data from hospitals. Like if we're going to let you have uh, Medicaid reimbursement, like you're going to need to provide us this data. So that's not that difficult or not insurmountable. Um, but a big issue in the United States is that public health is really fragmented. Right. Um, and so it's not like the CDC is in charge of all public health. Like a lot of it is on the states and territories and, and tribal lands to actually monitor and implement their own systems. And so the Biden administration has also requested funding for um, better information services to try to provide the networks necessary to report these kinds of data. Um, but you're right, there there is a fragmentation of who gets to make these decisions 
Um, and so there are a few coordinating bodies or, or people that are trying to coordinate this, especially globally, uh, where like the World Health Organization is putting together a group for this, or Rockefeller um, has a group that also wants to be like the international leader for getting this genomic surveillance data together. Um, it requires everyone to be on the same page. It requires funding to be tied to data standards. Um, and it's going to require a lot of work. But I think yeah, that so it's going to be a worthwhile endeavor. And so you're like, you've got to try. Yeah. So going back to the, the, the fragmentation and, and where the actual public health legal authority resides in the United States, it resides with governors and with public health officers at the state exactly. and sometimes local level. Uh, and, and they have, you know, they have pretty sweeping powers. Uh, when, when an emergency comes, they can, they can do all kinds of relatively, they at least have the legal authority, whether or not they politically want to exercise it, uh, to do some fairly sweeping things. But whereas the CDC it gathers information, it, it sometimes shares information, uh, and it issues guidance, but it, it doesn't have uh, the actual, you know, where the hammer hits the anvil, that's, that's, that's at the state and local level. So, and, and, and as in many other policy domains, uh, we, despite, you know, uh, three decades of of uh, the internet revolution, uh, we we still haven't uh, done a very good job of getting all you know our far flung uh, state and local governments to communicate with each other effectively. So that's that seems like a, a you know it's going to be daunting. Yeah, and and as a scientist by training, it's just so amusing in a sad way to me that the issue isn't the science so much as it is the like political willpower and coordination, which. Yeah, and there's just weird antediluvian things where, where you, to communicate with public health offices, you have to use faxes and just wacky stuff like that, right? Yeah, but there there is um, at least requests for money. Everyone kind of agrees that the CDC should not be receiving all their information by fax or that public health labs <laughs> should have more tools for delivering information. So I do think that we will uh, at least accomplish that goal. Well, let's, 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 small steps. Um, so where does genomic sequencing is something that was very exotic 10 or 20 years ago and now is really came to the fore as a major lens through which we could watch the progression of the, uh, of the, uh, the pandemic, uh, spotting all these variants uh, in, you know, close to real time. Um, how does how does that fit into uh, a, an upgraded monitoring system, and and uh, what are the piece what are the pieces that are missing to put things together into an operating system? Um, that's a great question. I think one of the key things to point out here is that when the Human Genome Project was run, when we like first sequenced the human genome, not only did we not actually finish it at the time, but it took like thirteen years and a billion dollars, and now you can sequence a human genome for under a thousand dollars, like on the order of a few hundred. Um, and yeah, I went from 13 years to, I have a friend who went from like a patient sample to the full genome to diagnosing what was wrong with them in on the order of like eight hours. Um, so we can use that same kind of technology that we've, we've really directed at figuring out what human DNA looks like to pointing it at uh, like viral and bacterial um, genomic sequences. Um, so the question of like, what does, what does that actually look like? How do you actually harness that? Or, or how does that fit into preparedness? I understand once the virus mm -hmm. is up and running, uh, you, uh, you can, you can watch it evolve, but, uh, how does it fit yeah, into, this, how does it fit into the pregame? This goes into like wanting to buy as much time as possible, um, to whatever, get your vaccines manufactured and distributed or wanting to know as soon as possible where an outbreak is happening so you can isolate that outbreak and prevent it from becoming a pandemic. Um, so it really is in early detection. Okay. And that's where genomic sequence is very useful. And so, so like, they're, they're at the like, outset. We're there at the outset, we're in pretty good shape, right? If if the Chinese hadn't just, you know, sat on things for a month, uh, the actual 
okay, we've got a problem. We're going to sequence the genome here and we're going to share it. That all happened relatively quickly. So there wasn't a big holdup there, right? Um, correct. But the Chinese knew what they had and were willing to share it after a couple months. Right. Um, but then we didn't know, like we couldn't tell in the United States, right? So if you were able to just sequence everyone that came into any airport or um, other kind of port border crossing, you might be able to find SARS-CoV-2 in them and be like, hey, we flagged you. This is a problem. We're going to isolate you or quarantine you in that case. Um, but we just didn't have that capability. Um, and the, the kinds of systems that we did have were very much like, let's check yes or no if you have something. Um, but those need to be tailored yes or no to what. Um, and so something like metagenomic sequencing doesn't need that, what am I looking for? Um, it can gather the information before you even really know what you're looking for. Okay. And so again, that just like buys you time. So it's like, I'm from California. We have fires. Uh, we have a good now system of like fire spotting towers. So they used to be like actual people up on a tower looking around for smoke. Um, and now there's a bunch of cameras, which are which are much more efficient. Um, but it's like, how quickly can you find that smoke? How quickly can you detect that fire? Because it's much easier to stop a fire at, I don't know, two acres where it takes three helicopters than it is once it's become hundreds or millions of acres. And you just need to like protect the houses that you can as opposed right. to stopping the fire. Yep. So yeah, really the key is like, can Good we enough. detect the pathogen early? so that we can surround it rather than do we have to wait until we have to like surround ourselves for safety. Um, so I, I know that, that uh, in the Bush administration, Obama administration, in the wake of various uh, sort of, you know, uh, outbreak scares, SARS, MERS, Ebola, whatever, um, uh, some, you know, international coordination mechanisms were established uh, to, to set up, you know, sort of global fire towers, uh, but um, but then you know that's defeated by just virus nationalism by the you know Chinese sitting on the information they had for a, a good long time. Um, so to to what extent do we need to uh, change things because we can't rely on foreign governments to be forthcoming in the early days like we wish they were? I mean, it'd be really great if we could require on foreign governments to be <laughs> more transparent. Um, but if not, then that's where the ubiquitous comes in, where that if you were just like monitoring everything all the time, you don't necessarily need that one warning from the source. You could detect yourself like, hey, these people with this, uh, these symptoms are popping up in Washington and they're popping up in whatever, Santa Clara, California and they're popping up in New York City, um, you could detect that trend without necessarily knowing what you're looking for um, because you would see this new anomalous uh, so in virus the case of, in the, a bunch in of different the case, areas. In the case of, of uh, the coronavirus, I mean, it was it could very well have been in the United States, you know, uh, before, before the Chinese told us anything, right? Um, yeah. So that kind of, you know, Viral, you know, pathogen panopticon, which, which you're just looking at everything. The eye of Sauron is looking at all times, scanning the landscape. Then you're you're less dependent on foreign government intelligence because exactly, yeah, yeah. And even if you if you just had the coordinating system in the United States, um, granted, we we do still need to do more technology development so that the cost of sequencing is cheap enough that you could really really get good ubiquitous sequencing, not just the sequencing, but also like sample prep requires humans with too many degrees. Um, but if you can get the system working, then you can tell the difference between an anomalous thing of like, it's just in New York City, maybe it's not going anywhere, maybe it's just a little blip, versus it's in New York City in San Francisco and Seattle, because that's the kind of distribution you would not expect from something local. Um, it would be likely imported from somewhere else. Okay, once we move past, you know, early warning monitoring, uh, a, a, another big element and what seems to me to be the most expensive element, perhaps, of 
of a comprehensive pandemic preparedness uh, system is development, uh, anticipatory development of vaccines and treatments. Um, so the idea is to identify all kinds of possible, you know, uh, viral threats or other kinds of pathogen threats, um, and uh, and then you know do research, find promising uh, vaccines and treatments uh, at the preclinical stage. You know, you find that on animal testing they're working. Uh, but then to actually start doing human clinical trials on these things as well, at least, uh, you know, through stage one and stage two, not the, not the big final dress rehearsal, but, uh, but, uh, but the, those preliminary uh, uh, clinical trials still take months, right? So if you actually had, uh, you know, vaccine candidates for the whole, you know, a whole slew of, of different families of risks, uh, then, that, that could cut many months off of vaccine development. And that, that, could, that could save years. millions. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think like we got really lucky with uh, SARS-CoV-2, that it was very similar to SARS, that we'd already been developing a vaccine on for, I don't know, on the order of 15 years. Um, because it's not trivial to decide what exactly you need to put in the vaccine or in the case of SARS-CoV-2, like how exactly to, to shape it different from what exists naturally. Like you don't just necessarily copy the exact sequence um, so that it can be stable enough for the immune system to recognize. Um, and I don't, yeah, that's, it's cheaper if you'd have more time, but I don't actually think the cost is, so out of proportion of the benefit that oh, it would get. Yeah, not. A, I, 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 I certainly uh, don't dispute that. I'm just saying, like, if you look at the, you know, the, the budget of the Biden plan, a big chunk of it is chewed up on this line item, I believe, um, because it's, it's there's a lot of different threats and vaccine development uh, and early stage clinical trials, even early stage clinical trials, are expensive. So, um, yeah. I, I think the estimate is around a billion dollars for each vaccine, um, which, you know, it's more money than I will ever have, <laughs> but it's the, the idea is to get vaccines for each of the 26 viral families. And I think we're, we've got basically half of them, close to half of them. So um, I think they're, they're starting off looking for seven that are the highest priority. Um, and so, okay, $7 billion. The, United States is also ordering two Virginia class uh, nuclear submarines this year, and each of them are about three and a half billion dollars. So for the cost of seven vaccines, we can get two nuclear subs. And uh, I think that the goal for the United States is to order two nuclear subs every single year until we have 66. Um, so I think that like the benefits that can come from having vaccines, not just in a pandemic, right? Like. Operation Warp Speed cost like $20 billion. And so for that price, we could have gotten 20 vaccines and been almost done with all of them. Um, is that a lot of these pathogens are currently infecting people and currently killing people and currently have cost. Um, like obviously there's cost in lives, but there's also just like a financial cost of that. And so it's, I think like a worthwhile investment. Um, and yeah, yeah it, is, it is a large portion of the cost, but like yeah. it's a thing that we need. <laughs> Yes, I uh, I, uh, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, the the whole pandemic economics is just crazy. Uh, <laughs> there's there's no cost benefit analysis. If you find something that works, uh, the benefits swamp the the potential costs by just many orders of magnitude. Uh, and so, um, yeah, being yeah, so we'll get to the fact that we haven't actually done any of this stuff yet because people are balking at the price tag. Um, but, uh, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, there is just no way to, to, to do any of this stuff without just ginormous, you know, social benefits, uh, net social benefits. So yeah, but, if only the, <laughs> yeah. well, let me, let me talk a little bit more about vaccine development and how difficult that is because, mm -hmm. Maybe we got an erroneous picture from uh, from the COVID experience, and in particular from the mRNA 
vaccine experience. So from what, you know, the news accounts, the, the Moderna people cooked up a vaccine over a weekend, right? They had, they had the basic idea there in a few days after, after, you know, having gotten the sequence of the, of the virus. So, um, to what extent was that just crazy luck because we've been working on, on, uh, coronavirus vaccines for a while, or to what extent is that just because mRNA technology is just so wonderful and supercharged that things that used to take horrible, laborious, you know, years and years can now be accelerated many fold. Uh, obviously some of both. And I don't want to say it's like luck because it's like, it's preparedness, right? We'd invested in it for a while. There'd been a lot of work in it for a while. So it's, it's like saying someone who can like shoot a basketball from the three point line is lucky. Like, okay, sure. A little bit, but also there's a lot of practice that goes into that. No, it, but it um, just, it, it did happen that this, the first global yeah. pandemic we had in a hundred years was very similar to pandemic scares we've had over the past couple of decades. Uh, if it yes, had, if this had if been, it had been a completely it would have been different, a different threat, all of that experience and preparedness would have been irrelevant. Yes. Um, but it is, it is also true that the, mRNA based vaccines are also there's also um, DNA based vaccines, which like we're not quite to the same point yet, but should have similar properties um, and be more like easy to ship around. Um, or DNA is a lot more stable than RNA. Um, they're just really great technologies because before what you would need to do is either like coax the virus into being less pathogenic so you could give it to people or hope that once you killed the virus, it still gave the same kind of immune response or grow up just a little part of the virus and hope that you can grow it up in like a close enough way to how it grows in your cells. But all of these are very like exogenous and other, whereas a virus literally does just like hijack your cells to make itself. And so that's exactly what the mRNA vaccine does, except for in a less hijacky way, in a more uh, small byproduct kind of way. And so it really does look a lot more like a natural infection um, than a lot of the older technologies. And it's a lot easier to manufacture. You don't have to coax the virus into being uh, less pathogenic, or it's actually really hard to produce just a small part of the virus in an accurate way. But it's not that hard to print out RNA or DNA, um, which is a fortunate, more recent technological advance. Yeah. So, so again, yeah, and again and again in assessing, you know, how doomed are we? We have this sort of race between advancing institutional sclerosis uh, and gee whiz, twenty uh, first century technologies advancing incredibly rapidly. And you know, can that bail out? Can the latter bail out the former? Is seems to be the question. And so, uh, of course, we need to work on the sclerosis as well. Uh, but uh, but there, you know. It's a hard grind, whereas we're making just you know amazing leaps in over the course of our lifetimes, uh, you know, in from 13 years of sequencing to doing it in you know hours and cost going down and so forth. So uh, the uh, our tools are getting better and better, uh, but our sort of policy software for implementing those tools is uh, needs to be improved. Um, so you would. You, you wrote something for uh, the Institute for Progress, and I'm sorry for bungling that at the outset, uh, in particular because the Institute for Progress has, uh, has a lot of Niskanen Center DNA. Uh, uh, so Alex Stapp, the, one of the co-founders and co-CEO, uh, worked with us. Um, uh, Jeremy, uh, uh, in the immigration section, he's a Niskanen alum. So uh, so anyway, we're, we're happy to have... Uh, an even newer kid on the block doing such interesting work. And uh, so, but in one of, in a paper you wrote uh, that's on, on the Institute for Progress's website about uh, uh, expanding the role for BARDA. Um, now, a lot of the retrospective talk about what went wrong has focused on CDC a lot and also on the FDA. Uh, BARDA is, is something that, uh, you know, I've been reading up a lot on, uh, Tried to keep up, you know, during the course of the crisis, and I've been reading a lot to prepare for these interviews. And and uh, and Bard is pretty obscure. Uh, even even when you're reading a lot, it remains pretty obscure. So tell me about Barda um, and how it could be uh, 
how its mission could be expanded to make it, uh, you know, a, a bigger player in what we need to do. I think the interesting part is that its mission doesn't need to be expanded. It, its mission is to prepare medical countermeasures for these kinds of public health issues. So within their purview is also like a nuclear threats, uh, chemical weapons, biological weapons, and also pandemics or naturally occurring pandemics. So um, it's not like, it doesn't need to, to be redirected in any way. It just needs to be like given more resources. So, so what so BARDA just, does just is- Let me interrupt you just for a second. My understanding was that when it, when was it created? Do you, do you recall? Um, um, I think it was created in 2006 as okay. part of the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act. Okay. So, so it, I, I, my thought is that it had at least that, that its remit was broad, including naturally occurring uh, pandemics as well as <laughs> man-made, you know, biosecurity threats like germ warfare and as well as nuclear war and so forth, chemical weapons. But my understanding is that it, that its attention had been more on, on the sort of bioweapon side and less on the pand pandemic side. Sure, because that's what was seen as a larger threat, um, uh, especially after the like anthrax attacks. Right. It was very clear how a biological hazard could be used maliciously. And it'd been, I don't know, 100 years since there'd been a pandemic to the scale that most people noticed. So argue like HIV is a pandemic. Um, there's been other influenza outbreaks that have been considered pandemics since then. Um, but that was what people were noticing. And so you're right. It, I think there's there's some a little bit of tension too about preparing for all of the hazards that we know about versus preparing in such a way that we're prepared for any hazard. Um, and so there's um, an act that was been proposed in Congress called the Disease X Act, which would try to have PARDA prepare for disease X, which just means like getting good at preparing for threats to the point where you could prepare for any threat very quickly. And where, where in, where is BARDA housed? Is it part, BARDA of HHS, is part of HHS? Inside, correct. BARDA is inside the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response, okay. which is inside Health and Human Services. And, and so if it's, if it's already got the right focus uh, and mission, what does it need to prosecute that mission more effectively? Or let me back up a little bit. What what role did it play in the in the COVID pandemic response? Was it to what extent was it involved in in Operation Warp Speed or in in yes? So Barda's main job is to say, okay, here's a threat that exists that the market doesn't normally, I don't know, want to prepare for. There's no like, generally there's no buyer for, right. I don't know, uh, smallpox vaccines, right? Cause it's just not a threat we usually have to deal with, but it is a concern of the US government because if smallpox was to infect the United States, it'd be very bad. Um, and so BARDA will find people who are capable of making those vaccines and how, have the technology and help them develop that technology. So help them get it to a point where it can go through clinical trials, help them get it through clinical trials, help them work with the FDA to get it to the point where they could like throw it in the stockpile. Um, and so for Operation Warp Speed, they worked with the Department of Defense uh, because BARDA already had those relationships with those groups that could produce vaccines. So it was already integrated into the American biotechnology community. Okay. Um, and had practice working with those kinds of groups. So it was able to support this like interagency group um, to get the vaccine to the finish line. And so the argument of like who who did more, DOD or BARDA, like they worked together. Like they wouldn't have been able to do it without each other. Okay. So for for this, you know, development of vaccines and treatments uh, in a in a you know, anticipatory way, do you see BARDA as the as the uh, you know organ of the U.S. government currently best situated to to play the, to play the lead role in that for developing vaccines for each of the viral families? Yes, that's that's what they were created for um, to to create these kinds of technologies with the private sector 
Um, and they also have had the ability did, did the, to- Did the Biden plan, did the bipartisan commission, uh, did they did they specify that BARDA's, you know, ramped up role in, in this? Um, I believe, yes. Definitely the Biden plan very specifically says ASPR uh, and BARDA is part of ASPR. Okay. There's also part of, there's a, there's a unit in BARDA where the acronym, I can't remember what it, what, what it stands for cutely, but it's drive. And it's, it's a, mm-hmm. it's like an in-house venture capital, nonprofit venture capital firm. <clears throat> I did not know that there was an equivalent, uh, uh, sort of not in-house, but, but affiliated nonprofit venture capital firm for the CIA called NQTEL, uh, which invests in groovy technologies that the CIA thinks, you know, uh, might be useful uh, for intelligence gathering. So drive is kind of an analog in the biosecurity space. Um, so it, it, it at least is, has been stood up and given the authority, if not the money, uh, to, uh, to pick promising companies to, uh, whose research is interesting to support them uh, and push them along towards development. Um, but right now they have some pittance of money that they, that they can deal with. Is that, it, that is correct? That is correct. Um, maybe you have the number in front of you. I don't, but it's, it's something that like on the order of like hundreds of th- hundreds of millions of dollars okay. when any, any good biotech VC has billions. You're so, right. so would that be, would, would BARDA operating through drive be a, an important part of, of this vaccine development process? I think that BARDA without Drive could do a lot in the vaccine development space because it can pick existing groups um, to do work with. But for getting new technologies that will help us more in the future, yeah, that's that's where Drive comes in because they can kind of bet on new promising technologies uh, in a way that the larger BARDA might not. Larger BARDA might go for a little safer, although if they really had like all the finances that they need, then like maybe they could be more risk taking. Um, but they don't currently have that bandwidth. And so Drive is able to invest small amounts in technologies that might be promising. Um, like a few years ago, that could have been like intranasal vaccines. So rather than using a needle, you can try to like pop something in someone's nose. Or I mentioned DNA-based vaccines. Right. Um, they're, they're true DNA-based, like not inside a virus, a uh, viral vector. They just haven't really gotten there yet. Um, it's a little hard to get DNA into cells. Okay. And so companies that can come up with the kinds of technologies to overcome that hurdle are the kinds of things that Barter Drive could invest in in the vaccine space. Okay. Let's switch gears to lab safety and regulation. Um, so there's there's a lot of double-edged swords in, in uh, the biosecurity field. So all these... Di- technological developments that are making it easier to study uh, and to defend against pathogens uh, are also making it easier to weaponize pathogens, um, if one had a mind to. Uh, The sort of spreading global network of labs uh, that are studying uh, pathogens uh, is great for developing, you know, potential cures. Uh, It's also introducing the possibility of just security lapses and lab leaks. And those are not rare events from what I read. They happen with some regularity. Um, of course, there's a big controversy over the origin of, of, of the novel coronavirus and whether it, you know, whether it escaped from the Wuhan Institute for Virology lab. Um, we don't know. Uh, I don't think we'll probably we'll never know. Uh, but it's not a crazy idea that with, uh, that with lots of labs studying dangerous um, viruses and other pathogens um, that that we could you know be hoist on our own petard that that, the, that uh, through uh, through the through the very means we are trying to use to better defend ourselves occasional lapses in operational security could lead to uh, you know unintentional release meanwhile uh, if these uh, Sort of putting ever more power in in smaller groups' hands, where you can sequence things and print out, you know, genomes. So you can uh, uh, at a you know at your basic terrorist group's budget, rather than a than a nation state's budget. Um, uh, 
you know, that's, that's, that's nightmare fuel. So, um, what, uh, what do we need to do to, uh, to dull the bad edge of this double-edged sword? From a lab safety standpoint? Yes. Um, you definitely need to invest in just technologies to keep things inside of labs. It's kind of appalling how, how that's not a field, really. Like, it's, there are very few groups that are actually studying, like, how do lab accidents happen and how do we prevent them? There's a lot more groups that are studying uh, the kinds of things that you would want to prevent uh, uh, from coming out of a lab. And there's also really not that much oversight of laboratories that handle pathogens. Um, for things like select agents, um, which include Ebola, MERS, um, these like smallpox, these like the things that are like likely to show up in like a James Bond movie of like, oh yep. man, this really bad thing. Um, there, there is regulations around there and it's restricted for who can work on them. You need some government oversight. You need to tell the government what you're doing. If you don't, you can go to jail. Um, but for working with pathogens that are like the next step down, no one is keeping tabs on that. And as you mentioned, like you can change the pathogens, you can make them worse. And right. so that's, that's even the, if you make them the, worse, they don't fall on that list of like things you can't touch. That's the, the you know, one of the scariest of these double-edged swords and really has gives off a real Frankenstein vibe is the whole gain of function research where, where you're, you know, manipulating viruses, changing them um, to, in a, you know, completely, you know, uh, public spirited scientific effort to see how this virus might evolve in the wild. Uh, but at the same time, you may be creating, you know, superbugs. Uh, and then if your lab doesn't have great security, they could get out in the wild and kill everybody. So what's yeah. your, there, this whole idea of gain of function research is, you know, became uh, something that people were focusing on during the pandemic. And it sounds scary and it sounds like insane. You know, it sounds like uh, uh, here's something that's that has potentially disastrous consequences. There doesn't seem to be a lot of security associated with it. So what's your, how, how, how wigged out should we be and what should we do about it? It's like, I don't want to like scare people, but also we need to do something about it. Like it shouldn't, it shouldn't be up to the individual scientist to decide if the research is worthwhile, right? Because their motives are not the same as the general public. So it's not say like, there's not like talking about like whatever mad scientists doing crazy experiments, but for scientists to advance their career, they need to publish interesting things. Uh, journals and other scientists and actually people in general are kind of interested by these viruses that can kill people and ways in which they might be able to do that better. And so there's this like weird incentive for people to do this kind of risky research. And a lot of this risky research isn't necessarily like, let's make a vaccine for this bad pathogen. It's like, how could this pathogen be worse? Right. And so it's, it's like, is the juice worth the squeeze? Like the juice is worth the squeeze for the scientists who like needs to publish to get tenure, but it's not worth the squeeze for the general public who are like, hey, you're making things that could kill me. Like who gave you permission to do that? And so there really does need to be more oversight of these kinds of research labs. And there needs to be an independent body like looking at these kinds of proposals and being like, okay, this is work that would like directly lead to a vaccine, go for it. Or like, this is more curiosity driven and includes risk that is not necessary. So some, some questions can be just answered in a less dangerous way. Yeah. Uh, like you don't need to necessarily make the pathogen to figure out what components could be uh, more detrimental. So who exercises this oversight? Currently, no one. Who ought to? Who ought to? Uh, ideally, I would like there to be an independent agency that oversees biomedical research, something that's not inside NIH, who, again, has their own incentive structure to publish interesting research to get grant funding. Yeah, th this doesn't um, seem like an area where, where you know, self-regulation is terribly dependable. It looks, there seems to be a real sort of clubbiness amongst the virologists that, hey, we're no problem here, you know, go away. All this gain of function scare stories is 
alarmism, leave us alone, let us be curious. Uh, but uh, yeah, and it's not shouldn't be their call, right? It should not be their call. Um, if if it was truly only the virologist that could get sick, like if they could only infect themselves, then I might feel differently about it, right? If they're if they're taking their own lives in, into their hands, although I could argue they're like they've got grad students working in their labs who maybe don't fully understand there's weird power dynamics. But it, but again, it's just not even not even just the scientists. It's it's the general public they might have to suffer. Yeah. Um, and so I do think that the government needs to step in and create some kind of independent body that can not just like do the research into how do we make labs safer, not just like keep track of all the labs. Cause like literally we don't know how many different labs there are in the United States that can do this kind of um, pathogen epidem- pandemic potential research, but also to like look over kinds of grant proposals and look over the kind of research that's being done and be like, Hey, that's not cool. Right. Stop. Yeah. Uh, and it just, it just kind of, absurd and i feel like a lot of americans don't understand that there aren't those things in place <sighs> yeah um let me touch briefly on one other element of uh, of these kind of more comprehensive proposals which is development of next generation ppe uh, personal protective equipment uh, masks and other sort of you know body protection um uh so what is, uh, what is, what, what does next generation stuff look like right now? The kind of gold standard for, for, for personal protection is, you know, an N95 mask. It's what it, those kinds of things are what doctors use in, in infectious disease settings and hospitals. Right. So is, is there some new technology we need or, or do we just need to scale up, uh, production of these things and stockpiles of them, uh, so that we're ready? I, I do think that we need new technologies. So I don't even think a, a N95 is sufficient um, for COVID, right? Like it doesn't it doesn't seal perfectly. Right. Um, stuff can be on the outside that you then take the mask off, and that's that's hazardous. Um, and COVID is not the most infectious possible virus. Um, right. So an N95 is not sufficient. Um, and then, like, I actually own a P100, which is, like, the next level up, okay. which I wear when traveling or in crowded places. Um, and even, like, not, not only could I not wear that for that many hours, it's just not that comfortable, but it, it's possible that that isn't sufficient, right? Because, like, my eyes are exposed still or my skin is exposed if I have any open wounds. Um, and there are pathogens that, like, can literally blow miles through the air and infect things. Um, and so next generation PPE would be like cheaper, more comfortable and have features that current PPE doesn't. Um, so it'd be really great if my mask was like antibacterial, antiviral on the outside, right? So that if something does touch it, it will be dead before I have to handle it again. Or I don't know if you've ever seen, you've probably seen it like, like movies and stuff. There's those like kind of spacesuit kind of systems right. where like all of you is covered and the yeah. air in, into it is being filtered. Um, those are incredibly expensive, like multiple thousands of dollars and very clunky and difficult to use. And if we were at the point where something like that was necessary, like I would very much like the grocery stores to stay open. I would very much like to be able to like get food or medical care. Like that's healthcare providers should be able to have systems like this. And they're just not at the scale of price or usability um, for people to to actually utilize. So it would be great if we had uh, more antimicrobial air filtration, personal, like more closed off units because you can't get sick if it can't get to you. Right. Um, but yeah, we, we just like need more investments in that. So, so making a whole bunch of N95s will be more useful than nothing. Um, but don't necessarily cover us for all possible pathogens. Okay. So we've been talking about uh, new and improved ways to prevent pandemics. Uh, As it happens, there's a legislative vehicle currently winding its way through Congress called the Prevent Pandemics Act. Alas, it doesn't really do any of the things we've been talking about. So what does it do? Um, 
I was just very amused that it's called the Prevent Pandemics Act, where PREVENT is a, an acronym, which is prepare for and respond. Yeah, where it does not, in <laughs> fact, actually like have the mechanisms to prevent pandemics. Um, so there, there is a little bit in it about uh, genomic surveillance, yes. um, but it doesn't have the kind of funding that is necessary to actually implement these, these uh, comprehensive ubiquitous metagenomic uh, sequencing systems. Um, even in that component, it, it currently doesn't even allow CDC to work with any capable partner. It's very restricted to working with academic institutions or national labs uh, for, for certain funding components anyways. And that's just not who's doing the best work, right? The private yeah. sector is actually now jumping into this and yeah, a, doing very you know, good. I, and work. I don't want to slag on this bill. But it, it's, it's not, it's not uh, you know, constituted to be a big funding bill. It's more of an institutional right. change bill. Uh, and uh, so it, it authorizes a, a 9-11 style commission on the pandemic to uh, dig out lessons that exactly what a lot of people have been doing in a decentralized way, but in an authoritative official way. Uh, it sets up in a, a permanent office in the White House for pandemic response. That seems like a good idea. If such a thing existed, would that be the, so w would that be the place that was quarterbacking this larger comprehensive effort? Uh, so with BARDA playing, uh, you know, one role on, on, on vaccine and treatment development, but, uh, but the whole panoply of other measures ultimately coordinated out of this White House office, is that the idea? Yeah, that's the idea that you can coordinate between different parts of HHS, like CDC, FDA, ASPR, as well as potentially within departments. So uh, Department of Homeland Security has some programs on genomic monitoring, um, and Department of Defense also has some programs that look similar to what would be done um, on the domestic side. Okay. Um, and uh, so... So it's it's setting up the institutional structure for uh, for a for uh, you know people whose full time job is to worry about these things at a level very close to the ultimate decision makers. That seems sound. Um, it gives or it authorizes some funding for monitoring and preparedness. It doesn't actually appropriate it. So there would even if this thing passes, there there's yet another step to actually get any money out the door. Is that's correct? Correct. Uh, and not an obvious vehicle for that happening. Um, but meanwhile, there's just the, the funding for, for, you know, uh, the expensive jobs, uh, not expensive relative to the risks, but still ex multi-billion dollar expensive jobs that they need to do. Uh, there's no funding for it right now. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Biden administration had come up with a $65 billion plan for five to seven years of spending. Uh, by the time it got time to put something, you know, on the floor and build back better, it gotten shrunk to two or three billion, and then that fizzled. So now we've got Prevent Pandemics Act, uh, which again is a couple of billion dollar price tag, I think, uh, on the authorization front. Uh, but that leaves um, leaves out what looks like should be about ten billion dollars a year in perpetual spending to stay on top of this. Uh, and is there any explanation for, I mean, we, you know, Congress spent several trillion dollars in just bailing people out of the fiscal costs of this pandemic. Um, but spending $10 billion a year seems like uh, a bridge too far right now while we still got people dying of this pandemic. So that it, it seems unlikely uh, that people will get more attentive to these risks and more willing to open their pocketbooks a year or two from now. So this, it feels like the iron is as hot as it's going to get, um, and yet nobody's striking. Yeah. And I, it's just really sad that it's not anyone's priority. Um, it, most people agree that preventing pandemics is important. Diseases are bad. We can do something about it. But you, it doesn't work well into the political structure that we have in the United States, where you don't get elected because you prevented something from happening. 
unless you can really show like it started to happen and you clamped down and it was good. And even then people are going to be like, well, was it really going to be that big of a deal? Um, and so there just isn't the correct political incentive structure. Like it's not going to help in you fact, get elected. I mean, in fact, in fact, optimal reaction is consistent overreaction uh, to things that, you know, getting all ready for the next uh, killer virus when it doesn't really pan out. Um, uh, but that then causes, but doing that overreacting causes all kinds of political grief. Uh, back when I was a kid, the, the swine flu debacle uh, is, seems to be what, what was a real turning point in the history of the CDC from being a disease fighting organization to being an increasingly politicized and bureaucratic and academic kind of institution that, that it, uh, uh, it, you know, it cried wolf, swine flu is coming. It, uh, it rushed into producing vaccines uh, there were some initial false reports of bad side effects and then some actual bad side effects. Uh, uh, and then the swine flu didn't really materialize as a big problem. So the whole thing, rather than, well, okay, we got ahead of that one. And, uh, and, uh, but you know, we dodged a bullet. It was, uh, you know, the CDC had egg on its face. Uh, the director uh, was fired with the incoming new administration. Um, and, uh, and then, had a political director ever since. So it's the character of the agency changed. So there, it, it is a, it is a vexing problem of democratic political life, uh, that, uh, that preventing bad things from happening doesn't generate, you know, much credit. Yes. Especially when you can't arrest some terrorist and talk about what their plan was, right. That's yeah. like a very, like here, I can hold up this example. Um, but that doesn't really work with pandemic preparedness in that people it's it's not as visceral like I can see that right you just have to imagine these potentially bad things from happening and in reality probably if people were thinking in their best interest they wouldn't think this way but a lot of people would be a lot happier with five thousand dollar checks than or right. multiple couple thousand dollar checks than being like okay great we averted another pandemic because it just doesn't feel the same um, and so it, it really comes down to our leaders need to do what is best for us, even if it's not popular. And that's not how our leaders got into office. And that's likely not what will keep them in office. Um, and so I, I understand the conflict for them, but like people will die. I, if, if the uh, Congressional Budget Office actually scored pandemic preparedness in proportion to what the actual financial benefits would be, then maybe that would be different. Um, right. That if you can say we invested $100 billion and saved $10 trillion, that might actually motivate people to work on this. Um, but we don't currently operate that way. Well, thank goodness there are, uh, you know, candles in the darkness, like the Institute for Progress, uh, people who are uh, who are pushing policymakers to listen to the better angels of their nature um, and pay attention to the public interest in an area here where where, uh, you know, pennies of prevention are worth, uh, you know, uh, enormous uh, <laughs> tons of cure. Uh, uh, so, yeah. And thank you for bringing light to this, because I, I do think that by letting people know that there are options for preventing pandemics and it is in their best interest, if it's an individual's priority, they can let their Congress people know that and they can vote for individuals that do have pandemic prevention as a part of their platform. Um, and so even though the status quo might be that there isn't a real incentive, like we can change the status quo. Great. Well, thank you, Nikki Turan from the Institute for Progress for being with me today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for chatting with me.